It's like a tinderbox, it's just waiting for the spark. It's gonna happen at some stage, there's gonna be a fire. No one must condone the violence, no one must condone the disgraceful events that took place. It should not have happened. They were criminal, criminal, and they should never have occurred. Riots are the voice of the oppressed, and these were the voice of the oppressed. After the waves of immigrants in the 50s and 60s, there were, by the early 80s, well-established black and Asian communities in Britain. This is the story of a struggle, at first by violent protest, then by political and legal means, against what they perceived to be their second-class status in British society. In April 1981, rioting erupted suddenly in Brixton. The rioters were mainly black youths, many with a deep sense of grievance. Their target was a predominantly white police force. It was intimidating. It was frightening. Um, you didn't know what was going to happen next. I was very, very surprised at the ferocity of the riots. Um, I didn't believe that that sort of thing would happen in my country. On one day of rioting alone, at least 45 members of the public and nearly 300 policemen were injured. The last thing I wanted was, uh, after it was over, to find a police officer hanging from one of the lampposts. The Brixton riots were not the first inner city disorders, but they were the first to get a political response. The Home Secretary, William Whitelaw, immediately summoned the Metropolitan Police Chiefs. Now, Commissioner leaned across the table and said, he said the Home Secretary would like to come to visit Brixton. Mr Whitelaw said, I'll come about five o'clock. And uh, the Commissioner said, yes, OK. And I, I just quickly whistled the Commissioner's ear, no, please, the rioting march started at five. So he said, well, we might start a fire, so Mr White said, well, I'd better come at three then. Whitelaw was accompanied by Timothy Raisin, the minister responsible for race relations. What you got was a very strong sense of enormous tension. You get a smouldering the sort of aftermath of it. Obviously, the police were on very high alert. I have seen enough damage to convince me that a serious breakdown of law and order occurred. I've also seen enough to convince me that the police have, in their very difficult task, and I want to say this again, again, and again, deserve the support of every law-abiding citizen in this country. One of the interesting things about all this episode is that it was, in fact, the Home Secretary who made the running. The basis of the Thatcher government at that period was that Margaret Thatcher would pursue things to do with the economy and so on, but that there was a kind of tacit, or maybe not even tacit, deal between Margaret and Willie um, by which she, in effect, agreed not to interfere with his department. I and mean, that was absolutely crucial. The events of this weekend called for the most thorough examination. I have therefore decided to appoint an inquiry under Section 32 of the Police Act 1964. I have invited Lord Scarman to undertake this inquiry, and I am glad to say he has accepted. He had a reputation, both as a highly intelligent man, a very distinguished judge and all that, and also for being an independent-minded person. Very important, if you had that inquiry, not to have somebody who could be accused of being a stooge. But Scarman's appointment came at a time of high unemployment, Black youths were particularly hard hit. 
Because the opposition blamed the job losses on Thatcher's economic reforms, Scarman and his team would have to tread warily. I think we all knew that the remit would have to embrace social and economic issues. Um, but we also knew that to say that up front would be to frighten some of the horses, uh, to upset some people in government who might see this as, you know, a um, uh, far more dangerous kind of operation than uh, they thought it was supposed to be. Only three months later, a weekend of rioting in Toxteff highlighted the fact that the government was facing a problem on a national scale. At one point, with casualties mounting, the police almost lost control. They were given permission to use CS gas, the first time it had been used on mainland Britain. The explosion of violence hadn't been predicted, hadn't been expected, which came with quite extraordinary ferocity. It shook, certainly, the political system in, in, in Whitehall and Westminster. Indeed, the Prime Minister determined to see Toxteth for herself and to talk to members of the local community at Liverpool City Hall. I can see her now. I was sat facing Mrs. Thatcher, I'm sat facing you. I, I was in the middle of our team and she was in the middle of her team, so I was sat facing her like that. And uh, she was leaning forward and she was saying, nothing can justify this behaviour, nothing can justify this violence. Um, we cannot have this, 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 this situation. It was, it was that, that, that kind of a tone. She never felt that uh, unemployment was a very convincing uh, reason for um, uh, trouble of that kind, bearing in mind that far higher degrees of unemployment had been born earlier in this nation. Um, but social problems, yes. And among the social problems were, of course, a breakdown in respect for authority, a breakdown in family life, a breakdown in respect for elders, and a lack of pride in the area. She really did listen, and I have to give a tribute to that, for that, she did listen. But you know, I think what she heard was so much outside of her experience that I feel she would be unable to interpret what was being said and act on that. But Margaret Thatcher did act when she returned to London by sending a special task force to Liverpool, headed by the Environment Secretary, Michael Heseltine. David Edmonds, one of his top civil servants, was with him. It was the days, of course, before spin doctors, um, but I knew Liverpool a bit, so I said, for the next, uh, the next part of the trip, let's, let's walk down to the, the harbour. So we did, followed by the press, and then let's get on the Mersey Ferry, and we did. Purely by accident, there was a black girl sitting on the top deck of the ferry whom Michael Heseltine sat and chatted to. Have you got any family here? Yes, yes. 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 The great luxury of what I've been given the opportunity to do by the Prime Minister is that I've got two weeks with a diary which is more or less empty, and um, so I, you know I've got the time to, to listen. Overall, I don't think that she had a tremendous view of Michael Heseltine as uh, a politician of depth. But by Joe, I think she was impressed by his presentational and his political abilities on Merseyside. When we first went to the area of the riots, there was a lot of destruction. There were still smouldering timbers. There were people who came to talk to us who had bruises, cuts, who'd clearly been involved in it memorable occasion when Heseltine met black youths who had clearly been involved in, 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 in the rioting. They said that they were discriminated against in terms of jobs and employment, they were discriminated against in terms of housing, and, and they were discriminated against by the police. 
Michael Heseltine allowed himself to, um, to observe the situation. He allowed himself to, to look at what was taking place. What do you make of all this? Well, that's not good news, is it? I understand this. That's five years that's been like that. I think he was visibly shocked, which contrasts with, with the view of Margaret Thatcher. That there's no deprivation here. In London, Scarman was busy conducting his own inquiry into the causes of the Brixton riots. His official terms of reference meant that his main focus had to be on police behaviour and relations with the black community. One of the prime causes of discontent was saturation policing and the use of the notorious sus law to stop anyone thought to be acting suspiciously. Much of the criticism was levelled at young police officers. The majority are, are, are they're, 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 they're youths, man, they're kids. They're not qualified police officers who can talk to people. They don't know how to talk to people. The 18, 19, look what 18, 19, just cut out cadet school. And they're going on and Come here making sure, sure the power. They're they're big fucking people with big, like, big, big blokes like them. Right. Must have respect, man. Of course. They don't show no respect. They don't respect show us no respect. 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 How the hell are we going to show them any respect? My recollection is that the percentage of street robberies um, committed by black youths and men was something in the region of 80 to 90 percent and the victims were mainly white as they say they're doing their job yeah but at the same time i mean you have to compromise in a sense in the sense where you can't harass people every day day in day out because this in is black you know? are they really doing that are they really harassing people every day day in day out everybody move back everybody move back me out everybody move back me about the anger on the street spilled over into the inquiry itself. All these people at the back in the audience who were shouting at, at us, and uh, it was quite intimidating. I had the impression that we were on trial, that we were the defendants, and uh, that uh, the rioters were the defendants, we were the defendants in this particular case. Halfway through his inquiry, Scarman had an opportunity to see for himself what was alleged to be an example of insensitive policing. Officers had wreaked havoc whilst raiding 11 houses in Brixton in a fruitless search for bomb-making equipment. Scarman decided to visit the site of the houses which had been raided. And as we approached, we had to pass through a police cordon because the police were standing back at a distance expecting um, that there could well be trouble. We approached on foot and there was a very large crowd, a couple of hundred or, or more, with the lone figure of the local community, Bobby P.C. Brown, uh, standing in the midst of them. And as we approached, uh, a sort of chant went up, Skarman, Skarman, Skarman and we were swept on a wave into these houses um, and taken round. What you had was a well-meaning liberal judge doing uh, his, his level best, uh, but you sometimes felt, watching him at work, that it was a bit like sort of the district commissioner uh, out on trek. Uh, and I've got some experience of district commissioners, and there were some very good ones, but they were never going to be the ag agents of radical change. But at the time of its publication, the Scarman report marked a watershed by drawing attention to the depth and extent of racial discrimination. A new generation of black Britons who'd grown up here felt deeply alienated. It's available only at eight pounds. <laughs> Deprived youngsters who believed that they were deprived because of the colours of their skin, unable to get what they thought were fair opportunities of education or jobs, and suffering, as they thought, harassment, took to the streets because they saw no other way of airing their grievances. Scarman proposed reforms to improve police relations with the black community and to weed out individual officers whose behaviour was racist. 
Nothing to say. He also identified more general racist attitudes among the police. Scarman did say that one had to look at the informal culture of the police and of other institutions, the canteen culture, for example, um, which is a powerful um, influence on the way people behave in practice. Scarman made clear that good policing would be of no avail unless it was accompanied by measures to improve jobs, education and housing. But politically, he was realistic. I'm conscious that I'm a judge. I'm not responsible for the finances or the economy of the country. All I can do is to analyze the social conditions, indicate areas where improvements uh, could be made and ought to be made, and then leave it to the politicians in Parliament to decide whether the money is to be made available. I hope the money will be made available. On his return from Liverpool, Heseltine had written a minute for his cabinet colleagues. It took a riot. The title, at least, was provocative. The report that Heseltine put to Mrs Thatcher was not a Thatcherite document, but it was very carefully couched. It made very clear that violence as a means of securing economic or political ends couldn't be countenanced. And it trod a very delicate line between saying, we have to do something and we have to respond to violence. But at the end of the day, that underlying message was, it took a riot to make us consider what best to do. Later in 81, Heseltine had to go to the Conservative Party conference. I'm delighted to introduce the Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Michael Heseltine. He was extremely concerned about the speech that he had to make there. But I vividly remember sitting next to his office for several days while he wrote sheaf after sheaf of paper in his totally unintelligible manuscript, trying to get the tone right. What he wanted was a tone that conveyed the real concern, that actually said that we needed to change. Self-help has a limited meaning in an inner city community where 40 per cent of the young kids may be without work and if you're black it may be 60 percent. I know those problems. I grew up in the 30s with an unemployed father. He didn't riot. He got on his bike and looked for work and he kept looking till he found it. Our inner cities are just a signpost of a journey of despair and there will be no recovery without more resources. I am not willing to throw away the prospects of lasting recovery in an orgy of self-indulgence, false sentimentality and self-justification. And no one in this government is. Tebbit was speaking for the government. Thatcher held firm to her economic reforms. This meant that the solutions advocated by both Heseltine and Scarman were not taken up wholeheartedly. I think it would be a mistake to think that money can solve the problems. Money can't buy either trust or racial harmony. The Thatcher government did very little in actually putting in real jobs, improving the housing, improving the, the, the quality of life for black people in Toxteth. As far as policing in London was concerned, some of Scarman's recommendations were accepted. There has been some change, certainly in the rhetoric of senior police officers, and indeed in terms of institutional change, the development of liaison committees. But in terms of what actually happens on the street, the impact of policing, particularly on the black community, remains completely unaltered. The same abuses occur, the same tensions exist, and indeed there's a growing alienation and bitterness. The Tottenham riot tonight, police say a revolver as well as a shotgun was used. London's top policeman has given notice that his men are ready to use plastic bullets and tear gas. The warning came after last night's frenzy of violence on a housing estate in North London during which a policeman was hacked to death. 
The murder of PC Keith Blakelock, the only policeman to die during these inner city disorders, remains unsolved. The horror of the violence and the fact that there were other disturbances that year led some people to fear that rioting was becoming a feature of British life. What happened after 1985 uh, was uh, a growing sense uh, on the part uh, of the police and the public that the end of the road had been had been reached that unless uh, there was some modus vivendi some accommodation reached as between police and public in those areas then the outcome would be one that was absolutely catastrophic <laughs> 